beginning a brand new series today called Winning. Winning, all right? I want you to look at your neighbor and just say, Winning. winning. All right, Winning. It's a, this series is about winning, winning at life. And so you received a handout, looks just like this. Um, I want to have you take this out, have this on hand as we go through this message. There's a lot of things I want you to write down today. But as you're getting that out and getting a pen ready, let me just ask you this question. I want you to raise your hand. Just respond by raising your hand. If you ever played sports on a team, maybe you ever played sports on a team? Okay, lots of people, lots of people. I think everybody ought to play on a team at some point. There's just something that happens in you when you play team sports. I mean, you just get like developed as an individual. Uh, you know, growing up, baseball was my jam. That was my thing. All right, I played ball. I tried other things. I tried soccer. I tried basketball, but you know what those two have in common? Lots of running, right? I wasn't about that as a kid, all right? Baseball was like 90 feet, and you were done, right? Unless you hit a double, in which then you ran double that. But, you know, so, so I played baseball from like the age of four, started with t-ball, turned into softball, turned into baseball, played through middle school, high school, made the high school team. And so here's the thing. As a matter of fact, I'm actually wearing my Annapolis High School Panthers jersey, huh? Check it out. Still fits. All right, there we go. This is my team. This is my team. And um, here's the thing about my high school team, though. We stunk, right? I don't know if any of you guys played on, like, winning teams. We were not a winning team. Our high school team was terrible. Like, we lost all the time. And so for me, high school ball was just a warm-up. It was like practice for summer, which was called Legion ball. Now, Legion was where you would have a team that would draw from numerous high schools. And so my my high school team was terrible. We lost all the time. And then my Legion team, though, was actually really good. Now, interestingly enough, our Legion team would draw players from the worst high school teams in our county. It was like our Legion team was the best of the worst. Yet while we lost all the time in high school, we won most of the time, almost all the time, with Legion. And so when I look back, I realize like one of the biggest differences between my high school team who lost, and, and when I say lost, I mean like lost all the time. Like all we do is lose, lose, lose no matter what. That's pretty much, we showed up to a game like let's just not get beat too bad, right? Let's leave with dignity if possible. I mean, don't even worry about a W. Like let's just not get our tails, you know, stomped too bad. So the difference between that to our Legion team was really, it was like our attitudes. We showed up in high school just not wanting to get destroyed, but we showed up in Legion, ready to, like, kick other people's tail. I mean, it's amazing how different it was. And, you know, you, you had players that were a part of a losing team, but suddenly they became a winning team when you brought them together. We had this expectation. We showed up, and we were ready. And here's what I realized is that attitude, that attitude has such a huge role in our life. I want you to write this in your notes. Would you write this down? Jot this down. Attitude affects Everything. You see that in your notes. Just, just circle it. Attitude affects everything. And we know this to be true, right? I mean, whether it's sports or life, our attitude, our attitude functions literally like the lens through which we view life. I mean, think about this. Everything in life is driven by our attitude. And so if you have a positive attitude, we would say that you view things, you would say the glass is half full, right? And so a positive attitude is usually very optimistic hopeful, believes they can win, believes the best, tends to trust other people. That's positive. But then there's a negative attitude, right? Negative attitude, we would say the glass is what? It is half empty, right? The glass is half empty. We're pessimistic, tend to be suspicious. We doubt. We, we've got what I would call stinking thinking. You know anybody like that? Like they just, no matter what happens, like it's always negative. Like even if something good happens, they turn into a negative. You, and and here's, what I, here's what I can tell you. If you're here and that's you today, let me just let you know on a secret that other people aren't going to tell you. Nobody likes hanging out with you, right? Let me just, just let you know, okay? Nobody likes to hang out with stinking thinking people. Look at your neighbor and say, no stinking thinking. Just tell, you've been wanting to tell them that for a while. I just gave you permission. You're welcome, right? Nobody wants to hang around with somebody that's going to always pull them down. Oh, it's never going to work. My ship's never going to come in. It probably isn't going to last. It's, not go it's no good. Never going to win. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, oftentimes in life, our attitude has the power of really transforming our life. It affects everything that we do. And so here's what we're going to do. This series, this series, I, I want to, you know, I want you guys to be my team, okay? And, and if, for this series, I want to ask permission to be your coach. 
And what I want to do is just like a coach would rally his team before a big game. That coach is going to rally him. He's going to speak life and potential and challenge him and fire him up. I want to be able to gather together and have a pep talk with our church. And I want you to know we're getting ready to face, we are facing as human beings, as people living in Wilmington, one of the biggest challenges that any of us are ever going to face. And there's a game on the line. And I want to tell you that you are able to win at this game, but most people don't. And what I want to talk to you about through this series of winning is talking about winning at one of the most critical games in life, and it's the money game. It's the money game. It's winning in one of the toughest areas of life. Now, I'm so passionate about this because for my wife and I, now this summer, June is going to be 17 years of marriage. Isn't that incredible? Right? She deserves a hand for putting up with me for 17 years. And so we readily admit, like, it's awesome. Marriage is great. Our family's incredible. But what you need to know is it wasn't always that way. And one of the biggest things that just wreaked havoc in our marriage was money. It was money issues. And we spent the first 10 years of our marriage losing at money. Like we lost in every way possible. And here's what I found. We've been very open about our struggles and the journey that we've been on. And what I found is the more we've been honest, the more other people are like, oh, thank goodness, that's exactly where I'm at. And what I've learned is that what we've wrestled with you've wrestled with too. And there's a lot of us, we want to win, but honestly, we're in a place where we're not winning. We're losing when it comes to this area of finances. And so I just put together a quick gauge, quick test you can take for yourself to find out, am I winning or am I losing? So here, you can give this test to yourself. If you spend more than you make, you're losing, all right? Not winning. If you have too much month at the end of the money, you're losing, Okay, if you start the month with steak and end the month with ramen, you are losing. If you're wondering where your money went rather than telling it where to go, you're losing. Okay, if uh, Visa is funding your summer vacation, you are losing. If any time the topic of money comes up, it ends up in a fight, you are losing. If your wants are trumping your needs, you're losing. If today you puckered up when you heard that this series is about money, there's a really good chance you are losing. And here's what I want to tell you. The reason I know all this, guys, is just because it's been my story. It's been my story. And throughout this series, I'm going to share with you my story and our journey and what God's done in my life. And I know that what God can do in me, that he can also do in you. But the more I talk about money, here's what I know. Here's what I know about the room. Okay, we're all very different. Here's what I know about the room. Nobody here has money problems. But we all know people who do. Right? Nobody wants to admit it, but we all know people who do. And there's a good chance you're sitting next to them. Some of you are like, I married my money problem. All right? That is, we'll help you with that. We're going to help you. You know, I used to think my problem with money was that I just didn't make enough of it. That wasn't true. That wasn't true. My problems ran deeper than that. You know, Dave Ramsey, who's kind of money guru, says this. He says that 37% of marital problems come from financial situations. Think about that. The largest largest hindrance that we run into in marriage has to do with money. I'm convinced if most marriages could get the money component figured out, man, you you have to to find things to fight about. It's amazing. I know that's my story. When our financial issues got straightened out, man, our marriage just improved in a drastic way because money is a magnifier. If you have a problem and you throw money issues into it, the problem becomes bigger. And so we've got to get that straightened out. Listen to this. 70% of all consumers live paycheck to paycheck, meaning one catastrophic disaster in our home and we are done. And that's not a safe place. That's not a good place to be. The average family would have to use a credit card to pay for a $1,500 unexpected expense. So if the car breaks or something in the house breaks, we don't have the money in our savings to cover that. That's not good. And then this, nearly half of all Americans have less than $10,000 saved for retirement. Now, I don't tell you those things to bum you out, to make you feel guilty about that. I tell you that because here's what I believe. No matter where you are today, with what we're talking about in this series, God can take you from where you are today. You may feel like you're in a place where you are losing financially. Here's my promise to you. You begin to take these principles that we're going to share throughout this series and put them in play. And I promise you, God is going to take you to a place where you go from feeling like you're losing to a place where you are winning in this area of finances. Here's what I've learned in my life, whether it's sports, money, anything. Write this down in your notes. Losing is easy. 
Winning takes work. You don't have to do anything. If you want to lose at life, don't practice, don't try hard, don't have any discipline, don't have a plan, just show up. That's pretty much what my baseball team did in high school, right? And we lost. It's funny. We would gather together as a team. Anybody have a team where you prayed the Lord's Prayer before you played a game? Anybody do that? Raise your hand. If you do. I always think that's the funniest thing. We live like hell all week long, and then it's like we're all in praying the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, and then everybody mumbles their way through the rest of it because nobody knew the whole thing. Right? Like God is going to swoop in and overlook the fact that you didn't practice and you're no good and just give you the victory. Now, I was always a little startled, though, when, the, when we would gather to pray the Lord's Prayer, and I looked over and the other team was praying, too. I was like, oh man, we got to pray harder, guys. <laughs> I think a lot of us do that in our finances. We don't put any work into it and we hope that God is going to swing in and rescue us. And Here's what I want to tell you. If you want to lose, that's easy. Don't do anything. But if you want to win, it's going to take work and practice and discipline. And it's not easy. It's why you know, few people are able to win in this area. And here's what happens. If we want to begin to experience just victories in the area of finances, it all comes down to our attitude because our attitude affects everything. I mean, if our attitude affects our life, that means if we can change our attitude, we can experience a change in our life. But we've got to overcome this negative, stinking, thinking attitude when it comes to the area of finances. So I want to give you three lies that lead to a losing attitude. Three lies that if you're not careful, you will fall prey to each of these. Here's the first one. The first lie that leads to a losing attitude. Write this down. Number one is this. All the church talks about is Money. You've probably heard that. you probably even thought that. All the church talks about is money. I know oftentimes there, there's people that will say, oh, the church just wants my money, or the church just talks about money. And so I want to deal with that on the front end. First, if that's the thought that you have, then you haven't really paid attention to the topics that we discuss as a church. Here at LifePoint, we're very committed to dealing with real topics, with biblical principles. And so every year, we set aside about four weeks, sometimes five, and we talk about money. We talk about finances. We talk about how do we manage it. We talk about how not to manage it. How do we deal with debt? What do we do? How do we do this in a way that honors God? Because it's a big deal. I mean, if you think about it, in this room, every single one of us deals with the topic of money. Now, if you were a pastor and you neglected one topic that was wreaking havoc in people's life, I would not call you a good pastor. I believe our responsibility is to deal with real issues with a biblical perspective. That's what Jesus did. Over half of Jesus' parables had to do with money and possessions. We would all agree that the topic of faith is important and prayer is important, but did you know that Jesus dealt with finances and possessions more than faith and prayer? And yet so many times the church doesn't want to say anything about it because we're afraid that people are going to think that all we want is there money? I'll tell you one thing, if you haven't been around LifePoint very long, is this. We typically very, very seldom will pass buckets to take up an offering. We put boxes by the door, and it's because God put on our heart when we moved into this building that, that, Jeff, if you would just teach people what my word says, teach people what my word says, and to trust me, I'll take care of you, and I'll provide. And God has done that. He's done that, and it's been an incredible blessing. But here's what I know. If you have this idea and this attitude that all the church talks about is money, when the topic of money comes up, you tune out. You tune out. But this is what I've learned. Like, why, why is that? Why would you tune out when a topic is being addressed that is greatly going to affect your life? Because we all deal with it. If we all would be honest, we'd all say, man, I wish I made more money. I work really hard for the money I make. I've made horrible money decisions, and it, I'd love to see something change in my life. I mean, that's all of us. And so why would we tune out? What would cause us to tune out? Could it be that there is an enemy in your life that doesn't want you to find victory in this area, in this topic? I absolutely believe it. It's just the same reason. If I'm preaching a message on adultery, guess who is tuning me out? The person that is currently struggling with adultery. They don't want to hear it. And so I want you to tune in, all right? Tune in. Somebody say tune in. Amen. I want you to tune in to what's going to be shared today. As a church, I believe we gotta, we've got to help people. One of the things our church is committed to is helping people. We have resources on our website, lifepointnow.com, to help you with money. There's resources to help you with budgeting. We'll share all that stuff with you. We actually, every fourth Thursday of the month, we have a gathering that is just for financial principles of helping couples and individuals, and it costs nothing to you. We got a team of just brilliant financial minds, and they'll sit down, and they'll help you look at your budget and help you figure that out. So, but you, but you got to come against this lie that all the church wants is your money. No, the church wants to see you blessed. The church wants to see you honoring God. Here's the second lie that we've got to overcome. This lie will lead to a losing attitude. And number two is this. Stuff can satisfy. Write that down. Stuff can satisfy. If I can just get the right stuff, 
Man, then life will be happening for me. Then I'll be happy. You know, instinctively, we know this isn't true. It sounds silly to say, but we live like it is. That new car, that new thing. And, and let me just set the record straight. There's nothing wrong with having nice stuff, okay? I don't want anybody feeling bad that they walk out of here and get in their nice car, okay? Nothing wrong with having nice stuff. The problem is when your stuff has you. That's when it becomes an issue. I mean, I ought to start this message by saying, Hi, my name is Jeff. Let's try that again. Hi, my name is Jeff. And I love stuff. You guys that know me, you know I am a gadget junkie, right? And if it has an Apple symbol on it, I want it even more. And so I'm always like, man, what's the new thing? Got to have that new thing. And then, you know, the iPhone 6 came out and, you know, I'm getting that joker. And now they're about a 6S. Mine doesn't have an S. I'm going to need an S. And, but if you are like me, you know stuff doesn't satisfy. You know it doesn't because there's always new what? There's always new stuff. And then your stuff breaks and you got to replace it. And so you're always on this quest for more. Stuff is like empty calories. It's like eating junk food, right? Fills you up for a moment, but then leaves you empty and leaves you so much hungrier. And so I want you to know, there's nothing wrong with having nice stuff. It's when your stuff has you. That's when it's a problem. Stuff can't satisfy. It never will. You were not created to be satisfied by stuff. Here's the third lie that we've got to push back from, and it's this. Number three, it's my money. I can do whatever I want with it. This sounds so true. It sounds so true because think about it. You got the job. You worked 40 or 50 or 60 hours, right? I mean, whose name is on the paycheck for crying out loud? Yours. Who pays the bills? You. I mean, it makes sense that this is mine because I worked hard and I got it. But the truth of the matter is this is how we got in this mess in the first place. This is how we wound up in this mess in our world in the first place. We're thinking, this is mine. I can do with it what I want. There's a better perspective, and I'm going to share that with you. I'm going to share that with you. So we've got to push back from these lies. These lies will take us to a pretty bad place financially. You know, there's a saying in our world. It goes like this. It says, seeing is, say it with me, believing, right? You've heard that. Seeing is believing. If I can see it, then I can believe it. But let me tell you, when it comes to winning, whether this is on the field or in life, I believe it is backwards. I believe we need to flip this thing around. I believe that believing leads to seeing. Would you write this in your notes? If you want to see things differently, you need to believe things differently. If you want to see things differently, you need to believe things differently. Let's make it personal. If I want to see things differently, I need to believe things differently. It's all about how we believe, how we perceive things. You know, I think about the story in Scripture. Just after Jesus' death, his burial, and he's resurrected. And Jesus reveals himself to some of his disciples. But one guy wasn't there. You know his name? Thomas. So Thomas gets labeled Doubting Thomas because he wasn't there to see Jesus the first time Jesus made an appearance to his disciples. And so could you imagine? I mean, think about being Thomas for a minute. Like, talk about missing an incredible moment. Everybody's like, Thomas, you missed it. Jesus is alive. We saw him. And Thomas is going, man, I miss all the good stuff, right? I was wrong place, wrong time. And so Thomas says, unless I can see for myself, I can't believe it. So for Thomas, seeing was believing. And if you continue to read the story, Jesus reveals himself to Thomas. says, Thomas, look, look at the holes in my hands. Look at the scar on my side. I think it's important to know that Jesus doesn't scold Thomas for his lack of belief. Here's what he says. He says, Thomas, you believe because you have seen, but blessed are those who believe and have not seen. It's one thing to say seeing is believing, but that's not faith. Faith says, I'm going to believe, and my belief is going to change my experiences. It's going to change, literally transform what I see. And so what I want to share with you today is just changing the way we believe about money and finances. So this message is titled, Believing is seeing. It's developing a winning attitude. As long as we believe the lies about money, we'll never see a transformation in our finances. We've got to believe differently so that we can see differently. I'm convinced you will not see a change in your finances until you believe your finances can change. It's about changing the way that we believe. And so I want to take you to a passage. If you've got your Bibles, open them up. This, are, uh, this passage is also in your notes. First Chronicles 29 verse 10. And what's happened in this passage, there's a guy named David. David's a very prominent figure in Scripture. 
David is introduced to us in the Bible. He's a shepherd boy. He's in the pasture with shepherds. But God has a calling on his life to make him a king, to literally take him from the pasture to the palace. But there's an incredible story that goes along this, this journey. So David, this young shepherd boy, ends up having this battle with a giant named Goliath. Maybe you've heard about this. David wins this battle, and it gains attention with the king. Well, God ends up anointing David as king over Israel. And so when he finally becomes king, he's the wealthiest in the land. I mean, like everything is going for him. Loads of resources at his disposal. And so in 1 Chronicles 29, David has it in his heart to build a temple, to build a house for the Lord. And so he begins making donations of tons of resources, loads of gold and silver and bronze, ridiculous amount of offering. And he begins to speak about God. And in this, we get to see five things that David believed. Five things he believed about God, he believed about money. Five things that I believe if we grasp will transform the way we see it and the way we believe it. And so I want you to look at this passage with me. First Chronicles 29, verse 10. It says, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. He's just given glory to God in front of everybody. He says this, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Saying, God, you, you are like before everything, you are after everything, you are everlasting. Verse 11. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything. Somebody say everything. everything. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Look at verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Now, I want to show you in this passage five things that David believed. And five things that I believe, if we believe, will transform everything. Here's the first. Write this down. Number one. David believed, number one, he believed this. Everything belongs to God. He believed that everything belongs to God. In verse 11, he says, everything in heaven and on earth is yours. I mean, that's everything right there. Everything in heaven, everything on earth, it is yours. This guy's your name on it, God. It's not mine. He pushed back from the idea that everything belongs to me. I can do what I want. He says, no, everything belongs to to you. Look at the second thing he believed. The second thing he believed is this. Wealth and honor come from God. Wealth and honor come from God. God is the one who gives us the ability to generate wealth. Honor comes from God. So he starts off, he says, everything belongs to you. So the stuff that I think I own, don't, I don't actually own. You own God. My car is not really my car. It's your car, God. My house is not my house, it's your house, God, it belongs to you. And you're the one that gave me the ability to even have it in the first place. Wealth and honor come from you. And here's the third thing that he believed. Number three, God is in charge. God is in charge. I'll tell you, when we grasp this, this changes everything. Your boss is not in charge. The government is not in charge. What the media says is not in charge. God is in charge. Verse 12 says, you are the ruler of all things. God, you're the boss. You're the boss. The fourth thing that David believed is this. God deserves thanks. God deserves thanks. When was the last time you stopped and thanked God for what you have? So many times, I'm so focused on what I don't have and what I want and what the next purchase, the next acquisition, if I only had this. When was the last time I stopped and just said, God, thank you. Thank you for the house that I live in. Sure, I'd love a bigger one. Thank you for the car I drive. Yeah, it might be a little bit old. God, thank you for my kids. Thank you for the clothes. Thank you for the food. God, thank you for what you pour into my life instead of constantly bombarding God with what I don't have and what I wish I had and why does everybody else have. When was the last time you just stopped and said, God, thank you? David takes a moment and he says, God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. God, it is because of you that we have anything. We ought to be giving God thanks in our life. Thanks for who he is. Thanks for what he's done. And then the fifth thing that David believed is this. We can only give what God has given us. Notice this in verse 14. He says, everything comes from you. So if it comes from you, he says, everything comes from you and we have given 
We have given you only what has come from your hand. The only way we can ever write a check, give online, text to give, buy something, the only reason we can ever do that is because God first gave it to us. So when we're giving to God, sometimes we feel like it's a great act of generosity, but really we're returning what God has already given to us. And David knew that. And because he knew that, he was able to be a part of incredible things for God. Now, David didn't always get it right. He also messed up royally, made a lot of mistakes in life. But here's what I find. Because of what David believed, we remember David today as a man after, say it if you know it, after God's own heart. What about the mess ups? What about the mistakes? You know what? We don't, while we re- remember those, we recognize him as a man after God's own heart. So gathering our team today, the pep talk I want to give you is simply this. I believe that what God can do in your life, in your family, in the area of finances is greater than you could ever dream possible. I believe it. I think one of the jobs of a coach is to rally the team and say, here's what I believe for you. I know we're going up and it's a big game and they're undefeated, but let me tell you what you are. You are winners and you are able and God can do this. And that's the job of a coach. And I want to tell you, church, I believe this in you. It's amazing what we can accomplish when someone believes in us. Have you ever noticed that? When somebody tells you they believe in you, it's just amazing how you have a little more confidence and you walk a little bit taller. When a coach tells his team, I believe in you, you can win, you got this, you've worked hard, you can do this. It's amazing how much different the team can play. I remember going up to bat and all of a sudden the coach is like, hey, hang on, come come here for a second. And he's like, tell me, here's what you're going to do. You're going to do this, all right? You're not trying to hit over the fence because you're Jeff Capusta. It doesn't happen. It only happened once in your whole career, all right? See that hole? See that hole right? And they're like, yeah, I got this. And I get there. I'm like, I know what to do now. He believed in me. He believed in me. I found that many people accomplish far more than what they thought was possible because somebody else thought it was possible. Somebody believed in them. There's a movie out recently called McFarland USA. Anybody see it? Raise your hand if you saw it. Oh, my goodness. Guys. Guys. You missed a winner. Oh my goodness. I don't even know that you can see it now. Um, You'll have to wait for it to be in like Redbox or online or something. Took my family to see it. Phenomenal. It's a real story. Real story. And um, love it when Disney takes a powerful story and just puts it to film. So here's the deal, okay? There's a coach. His name's Coach White. He's a football coach and he loses his job because he lost his temper in the locker room one day, threw a cleat at a player's face, all right? I don't don't think that's a good thing. Not condoning that. All right, so he loses his job and The only job he can get is in a small town called McFarland, California. All right, McFarland, California. And in this small town, very poverty-stricken town, poor mentality. Everybody there, they they harvest produce for a living from sunup to sundown. It's what they do. It's what their parents did. And so the teenagers at the school where Coach White gets a job, they've got a tough life. They wake up every morning. Before the sun is up, they're in the fields. They're picking produce. And then they literally run to school. And then so at school all day long, As soon as school's out, they run to the fields and they pick until sundown. It's what they do. Well, one day, Coach White, who's the PE teacher, he realizes, like, he sends these kids to run a lap, and he's like, oh, my goodness, these guys are fast. They're ridiculously fast. And he gets this crazy idea, like, what if we we had a cross-country team? No small problem. Cross-country is kind of an elite sport. It's only the wealthy schools had teams. And and, uh, anyway, I could tell you the whole story, but how about this? How about I show you just a little clip of what can happen through the power of some, of, of believing that's, you know, some, believing in somebody, believe in what can happen. Take a look at this, McFarland, USA. Welcome to McFarland. This is a farming town. These kids working here are invisible. They come from the fields and they go back to the fields. Mr. White, if we're going to reach him, now's the time. Cross country running. California is holding their first state championship this year. You do understand we don't have a cross country team? Yep. You've coached cross country before? No. You competed in high school, maybe? No. Well, you sound perfect. Anybody seen Danny? Danny Diaz? Hey, we needed seven. Yeah, seven runners, not six runners in. Danny Diaz. Hey, you're our anchor, Danny, and not because you're fat. And you are a little fat, okay? So we better lose some weight. Let's go. Just try and remember, lowest score wins. It's like golf. We don't got a country club. We don't even got a game work. Didn't know McFarland had a team. Fourth place. That's not too shabby. Fourth out of four, also known as last. Better luck next time, boys. <laughs> this is going to come down to which runners can handle the pain. Let's hit it again. Mr. White, each hour that my boys train with you, they do not work with me. That's food off our table. No one stays in McFarland unless they have to. There ain't nothing American dream about this place. I'm guessing running's the best thing you've got. Me too. What's 
going on? Team fundraiser. My boys need new uniforms. You are a good man, and so I'm helping you. Okay, now go shower. Oof. I'll be honest with you. The odds are stacked against us. You guys are superhuman. There's nothing you can't do with that kind of strength, with that kind of heart. Let's go show them how it's done. Dogs, Trace. So here's the. Let me tell you the power of the story. I don't want to give away the whole movie, but it's, uh, it's super cool. You need to see it. So anyway, these guys who have uh, really no hope. I mean, the winning is not a part of their life. It's not part of their legacy. Every single one of these these kids that he ends up coaching, graduates high school, first in their family to ever do that, go off to college, graduate, they go on scholarships, they, they graduate college, they end up being teachers, and they give back to the community, they contribute to the running program, and it, literally the whole town is transformed because one man believed that they could happen, believed that they could win, believed that they could do better. I tell you, there's something powerful about believing, there's something powerful about, about when you can't see it, Trusting the one who can. You see, a lot of us, we're in a place in life where we're like, I can't see it. I can't see winning in my finances. I can't see beyond my current circumstances. I can't see beyond, you know, I grew up in a family that was always broke and we never had enough, and that's just where I'll always be. I can't see beyond the current debt that I have because, you know, it's always had it, I'll always have it. I can't see beyond the paycheck that I have because it's what I've always earned, it's what I'll always earn. Can I tell you, there's something powerful that happens when we tap in and we get a glimpse of the potential that God has put in us. You know, God has a life and a plan for you, and it's not a plan for defeat. The Bible says you're more than conquerors, that you're victorious. One of our favorite verses, it's, you know, most of us would say, if I've got a favorite verse or if I know five of them, one of them is this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. It says this, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Think about that. God has a plan for you. And then he goes on and says this, it is a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God has a plan for you. And if you could just get a glimpse of what he has, man, you would trust him. You would take steps of faith. God sees things that you can't see. We can't see what five years down the road has. We can't see what our kids are going to experience. And so we've got to begin to trust him for what we can't see. I mean, we're called to walk by faith. Not by sight. Sight says if I can see it, I'll believe it. Faith says I choose to believe that what God says is true. The bottom line is we all have a choice to make when it comes to finances, when it comes to winning. And I want to tell you, God's word is true. His promises can be trusted. In the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, God makes some promises to his people. He says this. I want you to listen to this. Deuteronomy 28 says, if... Now, there's a big if here. If you fully obey the Lord your God. Now, I want you to take this word fully and just write it somewhere in your notes. Just write the word fully, not partially. See, a lot of times we want to partially obey God, but I want to tell you it's full obedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord will set you high above all the nations on earth. Could God still do this today? I absolutely believe it. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. Look at this. Continues on how God wants to bless you. Look at this. Verse 2. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if, there it is again, if you obey the Lord your God. Check this out. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. We got any country folk here? You can get blessed in the city and blessed in the country. That's not a bad deal right there. I want that. Verse 4, the fruit of your womb. Let's just admit that sounds funny, right? Fruit of the womb. No, fruit of your womb will be blessed. And the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herd, the lambs of your flock. How many of you want, you want your livestock to be blessed, right? Oh, wait, this is Wilmington. <laughs> we don't have herds and calves, and some of you do. I, I know that. There's a handful of people. But most of us don't. Here's what you need to translate that into. This was their livelihood, your livelihood can be blessed. Your job, your occupation, your business. God says, I can bless you. I can bless you. Verse 6, you'll be blessed when you go out or when you come in, and you'll be blessed when you 
go out. Like everywhere you go, you'll experience the blessing of God. That's what I want on my life. That's what you want on your life. And you can keep reading this passage. It just goes on of how God can bless you in this way and in this way and in this way and this way and this way. It's amazing. God is not short on blessing. He is able. But we have a choice to make because there is an alternative. There is. Go to verse 15. Verse 15 says, however, if you do not obey the Lord your God. So if you choose, like, I don't want to obey God. I don't want to fully follow his commands. I want to do my own thing. Okay. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. Now, this is the part we don't like. You'll be cursed in the city, and cursed in the country. It's literally the opposite of everything we just read. So the bottom line is we have a decision to make. We have a choice to make. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 says, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws, and then you will live and increase. Now, oftentimes we say, God, if you will increase me, then I will honor you. No, 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 you got it backwards. God says, you walk by faith and watch what I am capable of doing. You will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. Let me tell you, where you are today is not the final destination. It's not the stopping place that God has for you. He's got another step, a bigger plan. But it's going to happen when you choose to fully trust and obey. And then verse 19 says, I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. Choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. The choice is yours. What attitude are you going to have? How are you going to choose to believe when it comes to finances, when it comes to God's word? Because it's going to impact everything about your life. The choice is yours. And so over the next couple weeks, it's my hope and my prayer that you would continue to say, God, I want to trust you. Now, I know some of you, you're like, I haven't been to church in years. And I show up, and the church is talking about money. What are the odds? Listen, I'm not telling you that in order to come to life point, you have to believe everything that I'm telling you. I just want you to keep coming back and be open and say, God, you know what? I'm going to be open. If there's truth in this, I want to ask you, God, to prove it to me. So I want to invite you back over the weeks to come because here's what I think. My hope and my prayer is that three more weeks from now, that we're in a place where we're saying, God, I choose to honor you. This is my choice. No one can make it for me. I choose to honor you. You are the source of my blessings. And I'm choosing to believe what your word says is true. And I know that if I believe it, that I will eventually see it because you are a good God and you are able.